seconds out for a terrific new series of boxing videos. From champions of old to the current heavyweight king, these videos are full of action-packed boxing at its very best. Some of the meanest encounters from boxing history are in this cassette, aptly titled Grudge Fights. Just before World War II, the American Joe Louis fought the hero of Germany for the world heavyweight crown. But there was a lot more at stake than just the title. Ten years later, and Rocky Graziano and Tony Zell really went to town when they fought for the world middleweight title. Rumour has it, they didn't like each other, in or out of the ring. Nearer to home, and here's a punch I'll never forget. When he had recovered, Ali went on to win the world title, and he and his arch-rival, Smoking Joe Fraser, relived their historic fights, including the thriller in Manila. These are just a few of the tough battles featured in Grudge Fights. In two separate programs, the awesome Mike Tyson compares the style of some of the greatest boxers from past and present. And as a result, both cassettes are fascinating insights into the youngest ever world heavyweight champion. Now this is what you call boxing, what Mr. Fogg is doing. He's coming forward, he's jabbing, he's not going backwards. He's making a fight, because back in these days, if a gentleman were to run and think the place out, he perhaps wouldn't get paid. For closer look at some of the best fighters of all time, five programs are devoted to individual boxers. Here's Jack Johnson, the first black heavyweight to become world champion. This cassette follows his successful career in the ring and his controversial private life. Jack Dempsey, nicknamed the Manasseh Mauler, whose aggressive style revolutionized boxing and made him a hero of his day. A great video of a true champion. The Brown Bomber, Joe Louis, world champion from 1937 to 1949. This video takes you ringside for the longest reign ever at the top in heavyweight history. The legendary Rocky Marciano, a fighter who has inspired one or two Hollywood films. This video features the man himself and the real-life drama of a great undefeated champion. The man who shook the world, Muhammad Ali. After Clay backs listen to the ropes, he verbally challenges the champion, sets him up for the left-right combination that opens a cut under Liston's eye. has got some superhuman effort in him. The new champion, Muhammad Ali! Powerful tribute to a fighter many will always regard as the greatest. And finally, watch out for boxing's greatest fights. Mike Tyson takes a look at a whole bunch of nerve-shattering knockouts and devastating power punches. And a few rarely seen KOs with a difference. And there it is. I'm off to get this great range of boxing videos right now. On sale now from all good video outlets. Hi everybody, Kurt Gowdy again, and welcome to our greatest boxing champion. The age-old argument, who has been the best? We've already done the heavyweight division. Today we're going to take a look at the welterweights and lightweights. Next week will be the middleweights, then the light heavyweight, and our final show, show six, will uh, poll the Boxing Writers Association of America, top experts, for their opinion of the greatest champion of all time in each division. At the same time, we'd like to have you think it over and give us your opinion. Speaking of experts, with me, I guess, Jose Torres. 
1965 to 67, the world light heavyweight champ. He was a silver medalist in the Olympics at Melbourne, Australia. You can always say, as Casey Stengel, you can look it up. I, I could look it up. I don't think any other world champion or fighter ever became an author. A very fine writer, Jose Torres, wrote a book on Muhammad Ali, has been an outstanding newspaper columnist for the New York Post, freelancing now for the New York Daily News. Any more books in store, Jose? I'm thinking of writing a, a novel, a boxing novel. But I'm working on it now for the next few months. All right, let me ask you something. Now, you fought middleweight in the Olympics. The glamour division, of course, is the heavyweight division. A lot of people maybe don't pay the attention to the other divisions they should. But there are great fighters in this welterweight and lightweight uh, setup that we're going to look at today, aren't there? Exactly. I think that the main problem in this country is that they, are, they go for, the, for the, the big man. And, of course, uh, we understand in this country that the biggest uh, a most uh, outstanding athlete in the whole world is the heavyweight champion of the world. But in places like Latin America and South America and Central America, we don't have too many big uh, guys. We have smaller uh, people. For example, in my uh, case, I was the first Latin America ever to win a light heavyweight division, which is a heavy division for Latin fighters. All right, let's take a look now at some of the outstanding Champions of all time in the welterweight division at the end of the show. Jose and I are going to pick uh, the people we, the, the person we thought was the best. Uh, you might want to go right along with us. And of course, the, the first man we're going to take a look at, some of his highlights, is the onion farmer from Syracuse, New York, Carmen Basilio. Basilio in the white trunks is stunned early in the fourth round by a left hook. Basilio almost goes down. DeMarco was knocked out by Basilio in their last fight, but perhaps will turn the tables tonight. DeMarco stays after the rugged Basilio. Round eight is full of the same sustained action. First, Basilio lands, and then DeMarco. This is a real exciting fight. Not too much of a chance of a decision in this contest. Last time these two men fought, the first ten rounds were all Tony DeMarco. At that time, Tony aggressively pursued Basilio throughout the early round, landing effectively to both the head and body. Here in round 12, we have two courageous fighters still going at it. The champion Basilio has weathered the storm and is forcing the action. DeMarco appears to be very tired. Basilio, always in good shape, rakes DeMarco from all angles. And DeMarco goes down. As he demonstrated in their last fight, Tony is not an easy man to keep down. DeMarco clearly in trouble, gets up and Basilio bombs away. The pace in this fight has been terrific. The referee wisely attempts to stop the contest, but Basilio beats him to it. DeMarco goes down and out. His seconds rush into the ring to assist the former champion. Basilio's jubilant handlers lift their man in the air with delight. Here in round eight, Basilio in white trunk, always in top condition, rips bruising punches to Saxton's head in midsection. Saxton is not out of it, trying to fathom Basilio's style. Since Basilio and Saxton fought last when Saxton took the title, Basilio hasn't had a fight. However, Saxton has had three bouts in the last six months, knocking out Gil Turner and taking two decisions from Barry Ellison and Don Williams. As we move into round nine in this tremendous fight between Carmen Basilio and Johnny Saxton, it's a weary Saxton almost put down by Basilio. Basilio continues his attack, trying to weaken Saxton, watching for the opportunity to land that knockout punch. Basilio, with tremendous desire and condition, hasn't let up. No one could ever question Johnny Saxton's courage. He's taking bruising punishment tonight. A true champion. He won't go down and he won't quit. But Basilio senses that victory is close at hand and goes all out to recapture his crown here in round nine. The referee 
steps in and stops the fight. And Carmen Lucilio defeats welterweight champion Johnny Saxton to get back his title, which he lost six months ago. Boxing writers all over the world describe this fight as one of Basilio's greatest efforts of his entire career. Basilio demonstrated all the fighting qualities of a truly great champion. Terrific, dramatic action. So, Jose, anybody that was a fan of Rocky Marciano would have to be a fan of Carmen Basilio. He was much in the Marciano uh, mold. Yeah, he was a very exciting fighter. And he was coming in, as you could see here, he was coming in all the time, throwing punches. He was smart in his own way, and uh, he was a very exciting fighter. Let's, let's take a look now at a classic boxer in the Walter Wade division. And as you study him, you're going to see just what an outstanding boxer he was. We're talking about Kid Gabilan. Round one and Gabilan in the white trunks is trending off, an aggressive Tony Gennaro. The kid comes right back and lands a right-left combination that floors Tony. Gennaro's up again, but the referee continues the mandatory eight count. Gennaro waits as the count is finished and then gets his gloves wiped. Tony is trying to stay in close until he's able to clear his head. The action slows for the next two rounds with Gavilan going slightly ahead on point. But in the fourth round, the champion starts turning on the juice once again. Tony is trying to hold him off. Gavilan is like a tiger on the attack. Gennaro is then sprawling into the corner of the ring. But again, he quickly rises. The referee is talking to Tony to see if he's able to continue. He decides to let the fight go on. Gennaro slips and causes the kid to miss badly. He slips again and then is thrown to the canvas. The referee cleans the rosin from his gloves and again checks Tony to see if he's okay. Gavilan moves back in, still on the offensive. Gennaro is just trying to last the round. The champion is winning those hooks in on Tony. Gennaro staggered, but the kid keeps right after him. The referee leaps on Gavilan's back and stops the fight to prevent injury to Gennaro. Kid Gavilan, who won world recognition as the welterweight champion only three months ago, further demonstrates his classy form with a fourth round KO over Tony Gennaro. Gavilan and Turner are still at it, where the champion is getting off some explosive combinations, and he works Turner backward against the rope. Gavilan is trying to end it with a turn of punches. The crowd is cheering him on so wildly, they're shaking the camera stand. Turner tries to fight back. He's still dangerous, but Gavilan is not letting up. The champion wants to finish with a KO. Turner showing great courage, trying to weather the storm, but the referee jumps in to stop the fight. Did Gavilan wins an incredible non-stop battle with a knockout finish over Gil Turner to retain his world welterweight title. Gavilan lands a right that has Davey holding on, but he falls to his knees when robbed of his support. The challenger listens to the count and tries to clear his head. He finally rises to the count of nine. Gavilan's measuring Davy. Two beautifully signed overcuts and chuck it forward again. Davy came into this bout with a string of 38 straight victories, but the Cuban champion has had things pretty much his own way so far. Trying to finish Davy. Now Chuck hopes to stem the tide by doing some punching of his own. Gavilan won the Welterweight title two years ago by beating Johnny Bratton in 15 rounds. Since that time, the kid has won 17 straight bouts. A hard right sends Davy sailing through the ring rope. The game challenger climbs back into the ring and stays down to take full advantage of the count.
Here comes Gavilan. Chuck Davey is reeling all over the ring as the bell sounds. Chuck Conlon's rushed to help the ex-collegiate champion of Sue, but as round 10 begins, they decide not to let the courageous southpaw continue. Chuck Davey loses the first fight of his 39 bout professional career as welterweight champion Kid Gavilan successfully defends his title. Jose, they said that Kid Gavilan was such a brilliant boxer that you could put him to music. He was another man who was a very exciting fighter. But unlike uh, Carmen Basilio, he was a man who moved, who didn't look as a, like a great, uh, a great puncher, but he punched so much and so fast, and he was so smart in the ring. He was a hard guy to hit, but each time he got hit, he was able to take the punch and come back to dish uh, out some more. I think he was um, one of the greatest uh, waterway champions in the history of boxing. In other words, he had it all. Oh, he was a, he was a good puncher and a very deceptive puncher because he, he, he threw so many uh, punches and, and also he developed that ball of punch, which added more excitement into his uh, performance in the ring. Speaking of excitement, here's a, a very exciting fighter, Henry Armstrong, who uh, they said uh, the, the people that fought him, he had more than two arms. Let's take a look now at Hurricane Henry Armstrong. March 15, 1938. Baby Arizmendi on the right, hammering Henry Armstrong on the left. A 10-round bout. A crowd of more than 10,000 on hand for this one. As Baby Arizmendi, both men weigh 132 pounds. Henry Armstrong coming out of the corner to our left. Hurricane Hank, they call him. He never stops throwing punches. Baby Arismendi being backed into the corner. Arismendi with the stripe down his trunk. Armstrong and Arismendi fought five times. This is their fourth fight. One of the most exhausting fights ever seen. Look at them wail away at each other. Here in the closing moments of the 10th round. forcing Arizmendi back into his own corner. A tremendous finale. Arizmendi taking a severe beating around the head and fighting back gallantly, and now it's all over. A tremendous battle. And the winner is Henry Armstrong. What a fighter Henry Armstrong must have been. At one time, he held three world titles simultaneously, the feather, lightweight, and welterweight, and fought for the middleweight title. Nearly had four crowns at one time. And he fought a draw with the middleweight uh, champion as well. He was another relentless fighter who uh, came in with great determination and great will Every champion has to have will and determination, and uh, but this guy was so persistent that he was so it was so obvious that anybody, any boxing fan, any old United boxing fan, could see the perseverance of uh, of Armstrong coming in and not giving a chance to think to any other of his fighters. That's why he was he was able to beat many smart fighters in his time because of his tremendous and continuous pressure all the time. All right, now, Jose, the next fighter, a lot of the young fight fans uh, across the country probably are not aware of him, but uh, he was also a beautiful boxer and an outstanding welterweight champ. His name was Ted K. 
Kid Lewis, and he came from England, and you're going to see something very unusual in boxing. You're going to see a welterweight, Lewis, fighting a man named Gummer, who was a heavyweight. Now, this could not happen today under boxing rules, but it did happen, and you're going to take a look at it. Ted Kid Lewis fighting a heavyweight. At only 146 pounds, Ted is getting in there with a heavyweight, Tom Gummer, who tips the scales at an even 200 pounds. That's a 54-pound weight advantage for Gummer. And here's the fight one week later. We pick up the action as Lewis and Gummer are wailing away at each other. That's Ted Kid Lewis in white trunks. Gummer goes down from a hard right. The referee picks up the count. Lewis watches his man. Lewis wailing in once again. Ted Kid Lewis is a hero of English fight fans as he has shown himself willing to take on anyone, anywhere, as long as there's a ring and two pair of gloves. between Lewis and the fallen fighter as he starts to count. Basham is up, and Lewis moves in for the kill. Lewis stays right after him. A leaping right smashes Basham to the canvas. Johnny is trying to rise, but that punch would have thrown a heavyweight. It's all over, and Ted Kid Lewis wins by a dramatic 19th round knockout to set himself up for another shot at the welterweight crown. In Lewis's era, 1915, 16, 1970 to 19, they said, uh, Jose, he was 20, 30 years ahead of the fight game with his boxing style. And you could see that he has a similar style of fighters today. You know, he was the guy who, who threw more than one punch at a time. He was a guy who you, who you saw that was thinking at all the times, and he was a... Uh, he was a, a guy who applied the same type of style that has been applied today. So I think he was more than 20 years ahead of his time. One of the more famous welterweight champs of all time was a boxer puncher by the name of Barney Ross. expecting quite a tough fight on the 24th, but after the fight is over, I'll prove to everybody that I am not only the lightweight champion, but also a worthy junior welterweight champion. Barney Ross, lightweight king, and babyface Jimmy McClarnon, the world's welterweight champion, battling for the welterweight title here at Madison Square Garden Bowl, Long Island City. with the white stripes. McClarnon desperately trying to save his title, trying for just one haymaker.
Fight's over. A no! Welderweight! Barney Ross, the new welterweight champion of the world. Barney Ross, before your time, Jose, how much would a champion like you study the boxers that preceded you uh, 20, 30 years before? Well, I met a man who had a lot of films, and he, I, I, I've been studying uh, the uh, films since I met him with my manager, Costa Amaro. But uh, and I learned a lot. I learned basically the way fighters used to think, and the, fighter, the fighters, the way they think today. And Barney Ross, he embodied a tremendous uh, capacity to think and to fight and to take a good punch. He, he was almost a, a he was a great fighter, Barney Ross. Now, uh, at the end of our welterweight lineup, uh, you're going to select who you thought was the best welterweight, and I'll go along with you. The fans are trying to decide, too. This next man, some say, the experts say, he was the best of all time as a welterweight champ, and it is Jose Napoli. Here in round six, champion Napoles in white trunks is ahead on points. This is Lopez's second attempt to win the welterweight crown. Ernie was stopped by Napoles in the 15th round in the same ring three years ago. throwing bombs at challenger Ernie Lopez here in round six. The champion doesn't let up for a moment. There's the bell ending the round. Here in round seven, champion Napoles is definitely in complete control. A right uppercut drops the challenge into the canvas. The referee sends Napoles to a neutral corner and picks up the count. Sketch, he looks like a heavyweight. <laughs> uh, you saw him fight uh, in Mexico uh, down there, didn't you? And even in Cuba, I saw him fighting one when he was a terrific, great fighter. And over here, you could see he came to the United States, to Mexico, and he was known to the United States uh, boxing fan late in his career when he became the world champion of the world. And I think he was, he was uh, a much better fighter in his, when I saw him in Cuba and in Mexico. So we, we are seeing here an, an older uh, Jose Napoles, and I think that he, he, he passed his prime, what we saw here uh, today. He was in Mexico, wasn't he? Right, yes. Very he, popular there. He went to Mexico after, after the revolution in Cuba mm -hmm. and became champion while in exile. There is a term you hear now, pound for pound, and this term was really originated for a man named Sugar Ray Robinson, the best fighter pound for pound. November 17, 1950, Paris, France. Welterweight champion Ray Robinson takes on the European middleweight champion, Gene Stock. Robinson wastes no time and goes to work. In Stock, he finds a willing opponent. Robinson, pound for pound, one of the greatest fighting machines in the history of the ring, is a master tactician. Stock is a rugged free swinger who can hurt you with either hand. Robinson stalks his man, digs hard punches at the body, trying to set Stock up. Suddenly, Robinson is on target with a sharp left hook and hard right, and Stock is down. The game Frenchman still is dangerous, and as Robinson moves in, Stock lets go with a hard right. He forces Robinson to hold. Then Robinson opens up a blistering attack, a hard right to the body, and Stock is down again. <laughs> the 
Now it's Robinson punching with the power and precision of a true champion. Sends home a hard left hook, and that's all for Gene Stock. Going into this fight, Ray Robinson has a remarkable record of 124 victories in 125 professional fights, losing only to Jake LaMotta, who he beat on four other occasions. This night, it is Ray Robinson all the way over Gene Stock of France. That's Robinson with the white stripe around his waist. Early in round one, he floors Walzak with a damaging left hook to the pit of the stomach. Count of seven, the bell sounds, ending the first round. Again, in round six, Sugar Ray corners Walzak on the ropes and floors his opponent for the second time with a smashing left-right combination. The courageous Walzak refuses to stay down. He's groggy, but gets to his feet. Walzak is floored by combination punches to the body. The middleweight champion is going all out to end the fight here in round six. Once again, the game Walzak rises, but a pulverizing right to the body sends him down, getting caught with a final left-right combination as he's falling. The referee steps in and wisely calls a haul to the pulling contest. And Robinson demonstrates once again why he's acknowledged to be, pound for pound, the greatest fighter in the history of boxing. Quickly, Robinson floor stretch with a jolting left hook. Stretch is a heart-punching, really aggressive fighter, but Ray Robinson, one of the greatest boxer punchers in the history of the ring, maneuvers his man and gets home another left hook. Stretch goes down. Stretch will play possum on occasion, and Robinson, although no title is at stake, will continue to pour it on. An overflow crowd is on hand as Robinson hits from all angles. Stretch refuses to give ground, trying to get one home to halt the master boxer puncher, Robinson. It's Robinson with a left hook and stretches down. Now he's in trouble. On stretch of Germany refuses to give up, but Ray Robinson won't be denied. It's Robinson to the body, Robinson to the head, Robinson with a left hook and stretches down again. Now, Robinson puts the finishing touches to a night's work with a knockout of Hans Stretch in the fifth round. On his European tour, Ray Robinson KO Gene Stock in two rounds, Luke Van Dyer in four rounds, Robert Villemain in nine, and Hans Stretch in five rounds. Sugar Ray Robinson, a true world champion in every sense of the word. You take Sugar Ray Robinson out of this group, and it will be hard to pick who was the best. But with Sugar Ray involved in this group, then there's no doubt that Sugar Ray was the best waterway I ever saw. He'd be my pick, uh, Jose, uh, Ray Robinson. I guess he's just about everybody's pick. You think, really, pound for pound, he was the greatest fighter of all time? I think that uh, it, it would be very hard to pick an imperfection on Sugar Ray. He was a man who could throw. He was the first man in boxing who threw combination punches. Everyone before him, they used to throw flurries of punches. This man was a good puncher with both hands. He could take a punch. He was very smart, and he looked beautiful doing all that. So pound for pound, he has to be the best fighter in the history of boxing. All right, well, that's our pick, Sugar Ray Robinson, as the outstanding welterweight champ of all time. How about you? We're going to move on now to the lightweight division. And the first fighter you're going to watch in the lightweight division, a former champ, Ike Williams. 
The champion, Ike Williams, on the right, has been sharp shooting, throwing effective counter punches whenever the slightest opening presents itself. Bo Jack is back to the camera, carries the fight to champion Williams. Williams won the championship a year ago. He's a two-to-one favorite, but Jack says that his fist will determine who's the favorite tonight. Bo Jack is relentless. He never gives an opponent a moment's rest. He's been fighting professionally for 13 years and twice won and lost the lightweight championship. This is Williams' second defense of his title. He defended it successfully eight weeks ago when he took a unanimous decision from Enrique Boronis. Here, going into round six, Mike Williams is ahead by a narrow margin, but the sharp shooting Williams is about to explode. What? As a tremendous flurry of punches striking for Jack. Williams is turning it on now. Jack is just feeling back into the corner as the champion moves in to finish it. The courageous Bo Jack refuses to go down. Williams steps back, appealing to the referee to stop the fight, but all to no avail. Wright continues the attack, but the challenger is helpless as the referee jumps in to stop it. Mike Williams once again successfully defends his lightweight championship against the magnificently courageous former champion Bo Jack. Mike Williams has been the recognized lightweight king for almost four years now. He knocked out Bob Montgomery to win the title. Williams has defended his title five times, but he's also fought 39 title bouts. Altogether, a very active fighter. The champion gives in a perfect left hook and gives it down. He's up again, but looks unsteady. But he wants to continue fighting. Williams lands another left. The referee is yelling out the count. Gatik is up at six, and the referee wipes the rosin from his glove. That's it. That combination of four punches was perfectly timed. Gatika has to take his time getting to his feet. Ike Williams scores a smashing first round knockout. Ike Williams has been described as an explosive puncher. Those films show that. Mm -hmm. Him and uh, were both fighters, the Williams and, and, and Bo Jack, they were unbelievable fighters. They had a lot of determination and will, which was very important at that time. And I think that they were aware that they have those qualities at that time. It is very surprising. I felt that today's fighters are more sophisticated and they're more aware and conscious of these uh, qualities. And I, watching this fight, I saw that they were trying to destroy each other's wills. So, very, very smart. I don't know what you're going to pick in this lightweight division or our boxing writers at our conclusion of the series, show six, or the fans, but Ring Magazine named Benny Leonard as the outstanding lightweight champion of all time. And let's see what Ring Magazine was talking about with Benny Leonard. As round one gets underway, there is an electric excitement throughout the jam-packed arena. This is a dream match. The champion is a magnificent boxer whose unequaled ability has confounded 81 opponents since he won the World Lightweight Championship five years ago in 1917 from Freddie Welch. Lou Tendler, who has the unorthodox southpaw stand, leading with his right hand, is in the prime of his magnificent career. Lou turned professional nine years ago in 1913, and during the past nine years, he has lost only three of 85 professional fights and has never been stopped. Round 12, the last round of this great championship fight, gets underway. Round 11 was very close, with neither fighter gaining a clear-cut advantage. Prior to the fight, former lightweight champion of the world, Freddie Welch, said that the Leonard-Tendler fight was a contest that even the experts would all disagree in trying to pick the winner. 
Welsh said the difficulty was both men were experts at the style they each employed, and it was a case of the immovable objects being struck by the unstoppable force. It's no wonder that there weren't enough seats in Boyle's 30 acres to hold all of the fans that wanted to get in. As the round draws to a close, it's apparent to everyone that they have just seen one of the great ring classics of all time. Forty years later, these two fighting giants will be the yardstick used to measure the champions who came after them. There's the bell ending the fight. Leonard fought like the master he is. Courageous, brilliant, brilliant into the last out of the champion. But he fought a man worthy of his greatest efforts. And after 12 dazzling rounds, he's still Benny Leonard, lightweight champion of the world. What was your impression of Benny Leonard as you watched him? I think that that, that pleasure of him, I think, had the right idea in the, in picking him uh, the best fighter, uh, you know, the best uh, lightweight champion in the history. Uh, but we have to watch the others to see how I felt or how I feel about it. All right. Let's move on now to a one-punch knockout artist, and we're talking about Joe Brown. This is Brown's seventh defense of the lightweight title. Rossi in black trunks, a very capable opponent from Italy, is a crowd pleaser. Brown is considered to be in the best shape of his career, and it'll take a supreme effort by Rossi to take the crowd. Seven, Rossi hurts Brown, but the champion refuses to give ground. In round eight, the action picks up as both men pour it on. Rossi, regardless of a cut eye, stays after the champion Brown. But Brown, always cool under fire, sets up a clever defense, countering as Rossi tries to get home the big one. Because of that cut eye, can't answer the bell for round nine. The fight is over. Jose Torres, did you ever see Joe Brown fight? Many times. What would you think of him? I think Joe Brown was also a great fighter and a great champion. And uh, he, I think that I felt that Joe Brown never took uh, the championship too seriously. And, uh, and even though he limited himself, he still was the champion of the world a few times. And uh, because he lost and won the title a couple of times three or four times, and uh, he, but he was a great, a great champion with what he showed. Well, he had more potential than him. I could see that. Back in the 1930s, uh, the reigning champ was Tony Canzanari, and he's one of the most popular lightweight champions of all time. Now, just a minute, Tony. Just, oh, you ain't doing that right. You ain't doing it right. Not? No, you're not throwing your left hand right. You're, listen, you got a tough fight with this Barney Ross. He, he ain't a sucker. I know that. I know. Well, but now listen to me. I'll show you how to throw a left hand. All right. Now, put all your weight on your left foot and then and lean on your right. Now, now throw your left hand from an angle of 45 degrees Fahrenheit, Eastern Standard Time. Do you get me? Well, no. Will you show me, Bert? How do you do it? Well, Tony, I'll, I'll show you, but I'm... I'm a little too clever for you. You won't be able to hit me. Come on, eh? No, no. Now, come on. Throw your left hook, hook at an angle of 45. That's it. <laughs> I wasn't looking. Come on. <laughs> Some fun, eh, kid? All right, come on, boy. <laughs> Foul, foul. Now you got me mad, Tony. Now you got me mad. Now you... <laughs> Goodbye, Tony. 
That's Tony Cantoneri, ramming a go. Now they come out for round one. Jackie Kidberg, the taller of the two. He's five feet, nine inches tall. Cantoneri is only five, five. Cantoneri, a hooker. Jackie Berg likes to use that straight left jab. The opening moments of the first round of Schedule 15 rounder for the lightweight championship of the world. Tony Cantoneri opening up a good left hook. Berg was stunned, but he fights right back. Jackie Kid Berg, 22 years of age, born in London. Makes his home in England. His weight for this fight, 134 and one-half pounds. Managed by Frankie Jacobs and Saul Gold. This is the climactic third round. Cantonary defending his world lightweight championship. Jackie Kidberg, the world's junior welterweight champion. Jackie Kidberg looks full of fight, still moving forward all the time. Cantonary backing off slightly. Good right hand by Cantonary. Berg may have been hurt. But he's recovered now. A left and a right, and down goes Berg. A tremendous smash. Jackie Kid Berg trying to get to his feet. He's being counted out. Tony Cantonary ready to continue. Berg still trying to get up, and it's all over. He was KO'd by Tony Cantonary with that right hand smash following that left hook. As you saw, he fell flat on his face, tried to get to his feet, and was counted out. And there's the victorious Tony Cantonary. Cantonary, with his back to the camera and the white stripe on his trunks, presses forward in his usual aggressive style. Tony is known in the fight trade as a fighter who takes two punches if he can land a good shot in return. Cantonary keeps boring into Frankie, even though Click recently demonstrated his punching power in KOing Kid Chocolate to win the junior lightweight title. Click also is just coming off a 15-round draw with the great Barney Ross. Tony Cantoneri lost his lightweight title to Barney Ross exactly a year ago, and he needs an impressive victory over Click to get another shot at Ross. This is the second bout between these two men. In their first meeting, Cantoneri won a hard-fought decision over the junior lightweight champion. Tony seems to be daring Frankie to throw a punch, and Click promptly obliges. Click has a very badly puffed eye, and is trying hard to KO Cantoneri to end the fight before he can be stopped. But Tony has never been knocked out. Tony never lets up for a moment. Click is trying to jab and protect his eye. separates the fighters and Cantoneri moves right in as the fans applaud the roaring action. Click is still game, but that eye is completely closed. There's the bell. The doctor is waiting in Click's corner to see if he should stop the fight. At the beginning of round nine, Click is not allowed to answer the bell, and Tony Cantoneri is on his way to his second lightweight crown. Any non-student of boxing could know that Cantonary was really a swarmer. Well, he showed, once again, even though he was fighting before my time, that the fighters of today uses the same qualities that he used at that time in the fetish, and that is that he had the desire. He wanted to win more than, the, than his opposition. That's why he was also a great champion. A man of the now vintage, Roberto Duran. What do they say about him? Fist of stone, Roberto Duran. Champion Ken Buchanan of Scotland comes out for round one in the plaid trunks. Challenger Roberto Duran of Panama is wearing blue. 
An overhand right sends Buchanan stumbling. The referee gives Buchanan the mandatory eight count. The referee signals for the action to continue. throwing caution to the wind here in the opening round. A crisp left hook staggers Duran, but he regains his footing and lets loose some punches of his own. Thirteenth round, Duran is playfully ahead in the scoring. Duran has been landing long right hands that have kept champion Buchanan off balance. Watch for a pulverizing right hand to the body at the bell, which will send Buchanan crumbling to the canvas. Buchanan is writhing in pain, complaining of his hit low as his hand was rushed into the ring. Buchanan is in no shape to continue. It's all over. Roberto Duran of Panama scores a 13th round knockout over Ken Buchanan of Scotland to win the lightweight championship of the world. One champion Duran is wearing the green trunks. Challenger Esteban de Jesus is wearing the light trunks. Both men throwing dynamite punches. A left hook drops champion Duran here in the opening round. Duran is up at the count of three, and the referee gives him the mandatory eight count. Duran says he's all right, and the referee signals the fighters to continue. That was only the second knockdown of Duran's career. Roberto was scored in the opening round of an untitled fight against this same Esteban de Jesus 18 months before in that fight. De Jesus went on to take a close decision. Tonight, Duran has vowed to avenge his only loss as a professional. Duran looks to be completely recovered from that knockdown. Two through ten, Duran came on strong and took control of the fight. Here in round 11, De Jesus appears weary and hurt. Crisp punches by champion Duran. A combination of punches, and De Jesus goes down. The referee sends Duran to a neutral corner and picks up the count over a day's entire challenger. It's all Climbing off the canvas in the first round, Roberto Duran scores in the 11th round knockout over Esteban de Jesus and successfully defends his lightweight championship. He is a man who, after a long time in this country, caught the admiration of the, of the public of the United States because Duran is an exciting fighter. He is, uh, he, and he's a good looking man. And, uh, and when I first saw him, I knew that he could not miss becoming champion of the world. He has every quality necessary to, to, uh, to become champion. And when he won the championship, I was not surprised. Even though he beat one of my best friends and one uh, good Puerto Rican fighter by the name of Esteban de Jesus, whom we just saw here in the boxing with Duran, I, I have great admiration for Duran. And today he's probably one of the best fighters pound for pound today in the in the boxing business. You're going to put him up in the top drawer of all time in the lightweights, aren't you? I have to do it. Yeah. All right. Roberto Duran. Back again to Henry Armstrong, and so great was he. You've seen him in the welterweight uh, division. Now you're going to watch Henry Armstrong again as a champion of the lightweight division. Seferino Gosha the middleweight champion of the world, weighing in at 153 and one half. 
Armstrong weighed in at 142. Gosha, 11 and one half pounds heavier. Henry Armstrong on the left, looking to be the first man to win four world championships. He's already held the featherweight, lightweight, and welterweight championships of the world. This bout has been very close. Gosh has come on strongly in the closing round. Armstrong has forced the fight throughout. But Gosh has now begun to counter well. Here they are in the closing moments of the 10th round. Armstrong seemingly ahead. Armstrong fighting furiously at the finish. And the decision not known until later and then announced as a drawer so Gosha keeps his title. Henry Armstrong. How would you have fought a man like Henry Armstrong? I'm trying to visualize a fight, uh, visualize a fight between Armstrong and Duran, because they're, they're both tough fighters. They're both good, tremendous fighters, and they both have the determination of champions. And I'm trying to figure it out in my mind. Uh, by the end of the of the show here, we, I might be able to pick one of the of the two, or one of the others, because we have a few more to see. But it's very tough because Armstrong was a continuous machine and smart in his own way. You keep using the word determination when you talk about great fighters. It's very important to me because I think that's the, one of the major qualities that a man must have to become champion at anything. Carlos Ortez, one of the modern greats. Let's take a look at him now. Carlos Ortez. gets home a left-right combination and Matthews is hurt. Now it's Ortiz staying after his man. Ortiz pins Matthews against the rope. It's Ortiz banging home sharp, accurate combinations. But Matthews refuses to give up, showing great stamina and courage. Matthews fighting from instinct won't go down. Ortiz continues the attack. Ortez, second reign as lightweight champ, was a title holder at the same time you were the world light heavyweight champion. And we are from the same hometown in Puerto Rico. Is that right? Yes. Carlos Ortiz, as you could see here with Matthews, he was a great fighter as, as any, any other champion. But I think that he had a little bit more than just uh, other great fighters. I think that Ortiz was a super great. I think he was one of the most exciting fighters I have ever seen and smart. He was so smart. And he also proved that uh, boxing is not only a contest of, of physical abilities, but also a contest of wills. In other words, he, he was so smart that he was able to intimidate his opposition, not only with the punches, but uh, like Muhammad Ali with his head. And uh, that's why I consider Carlos Ortiz also one of the greatest, right in the same level with uh, Duran and Armstrong. Well, that must be some hometown to produce two world champions at the same time. Yeah. Hmm? Very proud of that. I'll bet. Now, we're going to, you're going to see something rare. You're going to see the only film available in the world of one of the legendary fighters of all time, Joe Gans. And this film was shot in 1906, Joe Gans. Here in round three, Joe is forcing the fight and is obviously not intimidated by the punching power of Kid Herbert. Gans throws a tremendous right to the body that drops Herman. The kid is up quickly, though, but that punch really stunned him. 
Herman has asked for this chance for four years, and now he's face to face with a man who is ranked as the greatest lightweight champion in the history of boxing. The old master, Joe Gann, is generally accepted as the super fighter of this era. Four through seven, it was all Gann. Here, Kid Herman lands a few solid punches, but he can't mount an effective attack against the champion. Joe Gann commands the entire race. He defends himself well, and he keeps the attack going by charging right at the kid. Champion Gans is fast and very tough. In one of the great fights of the turn of the century era, Gans lost a very close 15 round decision to the magnificent Sam Langford, who outweighed Joe by 60 pounds. The challenger is on the run as Gans tries to corner him and finish it. Gans is getting him with powerful head and body punches. Now watch closely as Gans maneuvers Herman into the corner. He has the challenge at trap. And now one blockbusting right hand punch to the head for Herman. Kid Herman crashes to the canvas and the referee picks the count. But the challenger isn't getting up. It's all over. Joe Gans once again proves he's the best lightweight in the world. Topped off another knockout victory for one of the greatest lightweight champions, Joe Gans. <coughs> this man was called the old master while he was fighting uh, Joe Gans. What do you think of him in this rare film? Well, you can see that that's a, a very old film. And, and, but you could, I could perceive and see uh, throughout the film that he was, that he stand among the greats, including today's fighters, contemporary fighters. I think he was a, a terrific fighter. However, the other, you know, among Duran and Carlos Ortiz and Armstrong, I think we have a, a, tough, a tough choice here because we're talking about great champions, superstars in the boxing business. Well, talking about superstars, it's time for you now to pick, and me, the all-time best as the lightweight champ. Who do you pick, Jose? I think I have to pick uh, Carlos Ortiz, because I think that he had the, he's the type of fighter that I admire the most, which is that he uses his head. And he's, and he's also conscious of, uh, of his intelligence, and he has that will to win, and the intelligence to back it up, and the physical abilities. He has the whole combination, a terrific balance, this fellow from your hometown? He's from my hometown. <laughs> <laughs> Very unbiased. That's all right. I Very understand. unbiased. Uh. All right. No, I don't think you are. I'd pick Benny Leonard. I don't know why, but I will. I'll pick Benny Leonard, and uh, not because Ring Magazine did, but the films I've studied. So w what we've done here, and what you and your minds will know what you did, uh, Jose Torres and I have picked Sugar Ray Robinson as the greatest welterweight of all time. I've picked Leonard, but this man is much more of an expert, and he's picked Carlos Ortez as the greatest lightweight of all time. How about you? Next week will be the middleweights. We'll take a look at the greatest boxing champions of all time in the middleweight division, and my guest will be the famous Angelo Dundee. Thanks for looking in.